Hello. Thank you all for coming to today's SETI talk. Uh, we are privileged today to have Phil Marcus uh, speaking to us. Phil is a longtime professor at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, he works on uh, giant planets and their inner workings. Uh, he also uh, works on uh, protoplanetary disks and their uh, physics, which is what he's going to be talking to us about today. He also has a third project going on, which is how to use computer uh, graphics and morphing to design uh, physical objects. Uh, so he's a, a very wide-ranging fellow, and we're pleased to have him uh, speak to us today. So his topic is the zombie vortex instability, a way to form stars and planets in protoplanetary disks. Let's welcome Phil Marcus. Thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, so let's see. So I want to tell you about zombie vortices, um, and you'll see where the name comes from. And I want to talk about protoplanetary disks. So here are some Hubble Space Telescope views of protoplanetary, protoplanetary disks. Those on the right are sort of face-on. They're disk-like objects. And in the center of the, the disk is it's not quite a star. It's a protostar. It hasn't really quite turned on all the way. And to turn on all the way, it has to accrete more mass. Um, and when it gets to a certain point, it will start nuclear burning and become officially a star. Um, on the left side are four views of protoplanetary disks from the edge on. And you can see in the center there, there you can't see, it's this, uh, the star that would be there, or protostar that would be there, is obscured by dust. So there are dust veins going across these guys. And the, the characteristic diameter here you can see of things is about 500 AU, 1 AU being the distance between the um, Earth and the Sun. Um, so we should think of protoplanetary disks as kind of manufacturing plants, and they're required to do three different things. First of all, they're supposed to turn protostars into stars, and to do that, they have to enable the protostar to get more mass, and that is a problem, as we'll see in a moment. The other thing it has to do is it, most of, it, of a protostar's protoplanetary disk is just hydrogen gas, and inside that gas is a little bit of dust, but somehow that dust has to accumulate and then agglomerate together to become massive enough so you can get runaway accretion and start producing um, planetesimals, which are the cores of planets. And then the last thing you have to do is the leftover junk from making planets and stars are meteorites. And if we look at our meteorites today, some of them have chondrules inside of them. And these chondrules tell a history, and that history has to be reflected by what happens in the protoplanetary disk. So those things have to happen. Um, the main concern that people have for star formation is that um, a big glob of gla gas collapses into a core. The cores then become disk-like objects because they're rotating, and because the main forces in those things are just gravity and centrifugal forces, um, you Kepler's law applies. So you get a Keplerian disk to form. And the problem with a Keplerian disk is that um, the orbits of Keplerian disks are stable. And you need something to destabilize them. Otherwise, you've got all the mass that you possibly want in your disk. But if it doesn't fall onto your star or protostar, you can't make a star out of it. And so what you really need to do is, just like when you're orbiting the Earth, you need to fire your retro rockets. You need to get the angular momentum out of the orbiting objects. So there's not that many ways of doing it. The only way people really know if you've got a disk of, of gas going around is you have to have a hydrodynamic instability or a magnetohydrodynamic instability that would disrupt things, remove energy and angular momentum from the orbit. So that's the main thing that people want, is can you get an instability to form in the disk? Um, the other thing that might happen that would be good if you could have instabilities, instabilities of rotating shearing objects like a disk often produce vortices. And oddly enough, vortices don't centrifuge out objects. These vortices um, centrifuge in dust. And so vortices are a natural birthplace for planets to form. And then the other thing is that when you look at the chondrules in, in meteorites that fall to Earth, um, the chondrules show signs that the, the protoplanetary disk must have been very well mixed at some point. And so you need that mixing also in the protoplanetary disk. OK, so the problem that was considered a problem until the early 1990s, and now is considered a problem again, is that a disk is stable to hydrodynamic instabilities. There's a theorem by the great Rayleigh 
about 100 years ago, who said if you have a rotating object and if the angular momentum per unit mass increases as you go outward, you're going to be stable to all kinds of instabilities. Mainly he showed that if you took um, uh, an object that was rotating and you swapped a couple elements in that disk, if as long as you conserved angular momentum, if you wanted to swap things, it would cost you energy to do so if the energy, if the angular momentum were increasing outward. So it's a very robust theorem and applies to many, many things. Um, but what it does apply to is unfortunately fluids that have constant density. And, and it may be, and in fact is, that if you look at the hydrogen gas around a protostar, you're not dealing with a constant density disk. Nonetheless, this was a paper that was produced, written in 1996 by Steve Balbus and others. And what they did was a little numerical experiment. What they did was they plotted, they, they started a disk, a Keplerian disk, with a little bit of noise. And they plotted the energy of the noise, not the energy of the whole disk, that of the noise, as a function of time. And this unit here is time in local years going around the disk. And they looked for, they kind of made up rules of physics. They said, well, suppose you weren't Keplerian. If you were a Keplerian disk, the angular velocity as a function of cylindrical radius goes as r to the minus 3 halves power, r to the minus 1.5. And they said, what would happen if you had different values there, different values of q? And so they did a numerical experiment with different values of q. For q greater than or equal to 2, the angular momentum doesn't decrease as you go outward, and you would be by rarely unstable. And so for values of 2 and 2.1, the energy first dips down, but as a function of time, the gain goes back up again. But just as rarely predicted, um, if two, this value of q is less than 2, like 1.5 for the, for the Keplerian disk, the energy decreases, showing things are stable. So this is a very, very widely a quoted plot. I was at a conference two weeks ago on protoplanetary disk, and this plot appeared, accounted 12 times. Okay, the problem is it's very misleading. In, in fact, it's wrong. Okay, um, so, so the point is that, that, that Rayleigh's theorem, like I said, only applies to a constant density fluid, like, like water. It wouldn't even apply to salt water. It, it really has to be constant density. And, and some people uh, in various research groups, mostly in France, have shown that there are little instabilities that can form, even if rarely would say that you are stable. You can still be unstable if you have um, a density that is not constant. And in fact, I'll, I'll return, return to this uh, terminology later. Um, when you have the density basically being constant, when the surfaces of density and pressure align, it's called barotropic. When they don't align, it's called baroclinic. All the weather that you see outside is baroclinic instability. It's because you don't have constant density atmosphere, and the surface of constant density and pressure don't align. Okay. So um, we stumbled on this, pro this problem, um, uh, me and a student, a former student, Joe Barranco, um, about 10 years ago, where we looked at protoplanetary disks, and we arbitrarily put a vortex, a spinning vortex, like a great red spot of Jupiter, into the midplane of the disk. In fact, we were interested, because we do a lot of planetary science, Jupiter's great red spot is very stable, and its environment is one of great shear because it's sitting between two jet streams. It's in a rapidly rotating system, that is, the planet Jupiter rotates in a period of about 10 hours, and the atmosphere is stably stratified, meaning that it's stable with respect to thermal convection. And all those things would be true in a protoplanetary disk. So we put in this little kind of great red spot of Jupiter into the midplane, and it, it, it it fell apart. It wouldn't stay there. And, and, but a lot of very weird things happened. We saw waves coming out of it. And we saw above and below the midplane of the disk, it just completely filled with vortices. And we didn't understand it at all. So in order to understand it, we needed to simplify our equations. So I'm going to reduce the complexity of the equations until we understand what's going on, and then go back to the full equations. So the equations that describe the fluid in, in a section, an annular section, a thick ring, if you will, of a protoplanetary disk, are very similar to a classical fluid problem called Couette flow. Couette flow exists when you have two boundaries that can either be plane parallel or concentric, and they're rotating so there's shear between them. And so you get that shear. And this problem has been studied for well over 120 years, but the equations are very similar. So I want to use those 
that system as a foil to understand protoplanetary disks, and then when it becomes comfortable with it, go back to a more complex system. The equations of motion, um, and this is for what's called a Boussinesque fluid. A Boussinesque fluid is kind of a, a compromise, if you will, between constant density fluid, which is very easy to understand, and say, the atmosphere here, which is an ideal gas. It would correspond to something that's not compressible, but, but nonetheless, its density can change. So salt water in the ocean is a perfect example of that. You could have big variations in density due to the salt, but still, you're not, if you take a liter of water, salt water, it's going to be very hard to compress it into something smaller than a liter. So the equations of motion, the top one, whoops, the top one, is nothing other than F equals MA. It tells you the accelerations on the system, and it has um, uh, pressure forces on it. It's got something because we're going to do everything in a rotating frame. So as you know, when a, if you're in a merry-go-round and you try and walk straight, you're kind of pushed to the side. And that's due to the Coriolis force. And this is a Coriolis acceleration. There's a constant there called F, and it has dimensions of one over time. And basically, it is a factor of two. It's just the angular velocity of the merry-go-round that you're on or in the rotating system that you're in. And it produces this fictitious force. And then there is, uh-oh, so this may be a problem. Okay, so this would normally sit on my own computer and it would have, I, I can't say anything bad about PowerPoint here, can I? Um, it, it would have fonts embedded in it. But, but some of those fonts don't transfer over when you show them on another machine. So we transferred the whole thing over, so we'll just have to deal with this. What this thing says ignore, is that there's density, at, and that's G is gravity, it's, right? If you're over dense, you'll, come, you'll, you'll go down. If you're under dense, you'll come up. The velocity is divergence free, which means you're not compressible, and the density just goes with the flow. There are the equations that are set here. Okay, so plane coet flow, uh, comes in two forms, coet flow, circular and plane. In plane coet flow, I've got two parallel walls, and they're moving, say, in opposite directions. So the flow inside is moving in only one direction. So I'm going to call the cross stream direction y and the streamwise direction x, which is the opposite of what astronomers do, but that's what fluid dynamicists do. And sigma is another parameter. It also has dimensions of 1 over t, just like the Coriolis parameter. And this is basically the shear associated with this flow. So it's a linear velocity. It's linear in the y variable with this constant sigma in front. And you can look at this flow, and you can analyze its stability. And when you do that, you find that the flow is what we call neutrally stable. That is, if I subject it to an infinitesimal perturbation, a perturbation with infinitesimal amplitude, Right. It doesn't, it's not unstable, meaning it won't grow exponentially in time. It's not stable, meaning which it, it, it won't exponentially decay in time. It just stays there. It's neutral. So it doesn't grow or doesn't decay. If I take that same system and I now rotate it around the vertical axis coming out of the board, which I'll call the z-axis, um, you can show that for the conditions that would be for a planetary, protoplanetary disk, this is also neutrally stable. It's not, st we really want things to be unstable. Okay, and finally, though, if I, along this vertical direction, the one coming straight at you, which is my vertical, I can stratify it. So just imagine I have salt water with heavier salt water, denser salt water on the bottom, and lighter salt water on the top. That's also neutrally stable. The stratification of the density is parameterized by a parameter known as N or the brunt weissler frequency. Like all the other parameters, Coriolis and Shear, its dimensions are also one over time. And it's made from, whoops, it's made from um, the acceleration of gravity G and then basically the logarithmic derivative of the mean density of the flow. And this is also neutrally stable. And that's the flow that I want to examine as my uh, ensemble, my simple model, if you will, of a protoplanetary disk. Now, um, let's see. I, I've been teaching fluid dynamics, a motor than I look, for many, many years. And, and I started teaching fluid dynamics to graduate students in 1980 when I was an assistant professor at MIT and I was teaching fluids. And one of the traditional parts of the curriculum was something called a critical layer. They don't teach critical layers anymore because they're not all that interesting, it turns out. But, but these will turn out to be interesting. When you have a flow that only goes in one direction, like a shear flow, or it could be an, an azimuthal direction, like around a protoplanetary star, um, if, if you don't have any explicit dissipation in the system, 
Um, sometimes, sometimes you can have a location in the fluid where the, the fluid velocity, it turns out, matches when I calculate these, un, these neutrally stable eigenmodes, which are like waves that don't grow or decay, but they move along at a certain speed, a phase velocity. When the phase velocity matches the fluid velocity, you can have what's called a critical layer, which means you can have a singularity, that the velocity that some there would, would have a logarithmic divergence. And Kelvin, Lord Kelvin was really interested in these things, and he thought that they would go unstable, and they'd produce vortices, and he even called them Kelvin's cat's eyes. But, but you never see those in reality. They're just not there. So it's, it's kind of an interesting mathematical question. In fact, it really is a mathematical question because really what a critical layer is this. So think way, way, way back to when you first learned differential equations as an undergraduate. Right? You might have had to solve them numerically. You might have had to solve them as a sum with a method of Frobenius. But the first thing you do in any case is analyze your ordinary differential equation to find out if it has singular solutions, that is, solutions with infinities in them. And the way you do that is you've got a differential equation. Maybe it has a second derivative, a first derivative, and no derivative. The coefficient in front of the highest derivative term, you look at that one. If anywhere in the domain you want to solve it, it goes to 0, then you can have a singularity. OK, so it turns out that there's a governing equation for the eigenmodes of a protoplanetary disk or equivalently for Kuwait flow. It's a second order differential equation. And you can look at the coefficient in front of that to see if there's a, tr a critical error. In the traditional case, the coefficient um, in front of that critical layer right, is 0 when the phase speed of the neutrally stable mode matches the fluid velocity. But that's kind of an artifact. It doesn't always that case. What I'm going to show you is that when you look at the equations of motion, all they've got to do is put in that vertical stratification, and new critical layers appear. Uh, new locations, and unlike the old ones, these baroclinic ones, um, you look at them cross-eyed and they're going to go unstable on you. So they're really kind of interesting things. So let me write down, I'm going to write down some math, but you could, I'll just sort of, we can just go through it very quickly. So the coefficient, right, this, this equation that governs the stability, this Rayleigh equation, or the coefficient in front of the highest term, whoops, the coefficient in front of the highest term looks like the unperturbed velocity in the streamwise direction, which is a function of cross-stream direction, minus the phase speed of the eigenmode. So when they're the same, you can have critical layers. OK, so right, for those who have done this before, the way you find a normal eigenmode is you assume that there's exponential dependence in the streamwise direction with a wave number kx, with a phase speed cs. The phase speed is actually, if I take kx and multiply it by cs, you see that. That's just the temporal frequency of the system. So when this guy or this guy, they're equivalent. When they go to 0, you, in a traditional critical layer, you go unstable. OK. Or, but if you add in stratification, there's a second term that appears in front of that one. There's the old term, but there's a new one, and therefore a new location. And that's that brunt weissler frequency, which depends upon stratification, and the wave number in the streamwise direction. And if that's ever 0, you can get a critical layer. And because in this particular case, we know what vy is, v bar of the unperturbed velocity is just a linear function of y, we can actually solve for the locations of those critical layers. And that is where we see all the action happening. So these new critical layers are unstable, right? They're, they're, they're still neutrally stable. But if I perturb them in the simplest way, they go very unstable. And the reason comes from the following. If I take that momentum equation that I started with, I showed you earlier, if I take the curl of it, I get an equation for the vorticity written as a little omega there. The z component, the vertical component, I can find how that changes. Now, the vorticity is basically the local spin of the system, right? So it's the curl of the velocity, which is a local spin. And it's got a bunch of right-hand terms on the right side, but it's got this other term, which is my Coriolis parameter, which is big, my shear parameter, which is big, and it's multiplying the vertical derivative of the vertical velocity. Well, in this critical layer, the vertical velocity derivative is going to infinity. So this is a really big number. And so this critical layer is going to manufacture vertical vorticity like crazy. And so that's the whole physics behind this guy over here. So to, to make a long story short, let me do a throwback. I said that we didn't understand a lot of the stuff. Joe Barranco and I, when we looked at this problem 10 years ago, um, we found these weird waves and patterns which we didn't understand. This equation here, which tells you where the critical layer, 
is, says that its location, its cross stream direction as a function of height, is equal to a constant. And if I'm not perturbing it with anything that depends upon time, that would be zero. Um, and times the brunt weissler frequency divided by some constants. In a protoplanetary disk, um, it turns out that to first order, the brunt weissler frequency is linear in z. It's zero at the midplane because there's no gravity there. Gravity pulls in from the top and up from the bottom. So there's no gravity, no stratification there, and then increases linearly as you go out. So this would say the critical layers should form like straight lines. So here is a picture from that uh, uh, paper 11 years ago. So if you can turn the movie on. Oh, wait, this is the vertical direction is vertical. The cross stream direction is white. And this is an initial perturbation of a vortex. And the black and white is, a, is the vorticity itself. And can you just turn that on? And this is something we didn't understand. It's producing waves like crazy. Those are just generally waves coming out the side. But these guys over there, those are critical layers. And those critical layers are going to end up producing new vortices, and they'll produce their own critical layers. So we were presented with this cockroach thing 11 years ago, and we didn't understand it. And the original vortex eventually will disappear. But, but really what we were seeing was we were seeing a new instability. And we didn't know how to analyze it because it was just too complex physics to analyze at that time. The energy that's going to drive the critical layers and whatever they do um, it doesn't come out of the initial perturbation. Right? There's this huge shearing flow. If I can take a little piece of that shearing flow and say, Ooh, I want you to move bulk so that you don't have any shear at all, but just conserve your momentum, that's a much, much, much lower energy state. And so what's going to happen is when this instability starts, it's going to take the Keplerian shear locally, and it's going to try and reduce it to no shear at all. It's going to suck up that energy and drive it into vortices and turbulence. Meanwhile, the Keplerian physics will come back and reestablish the shear, and, so, and it's going to draw its energy from the potential energy from the protostar. So basically, there's an unlimited amount of energy that can supply this instability. OK, so let me show you some of the calculations we did. So I just want to remind you, we said the critical layers are at a location. All right, um, when I deal with laboratory things like I'm doing it right now, I'm going to choose a unit of time and length that makes sense. So my unit of time will be 1 over this brunt weissler frequency. But my unit of length will be L. L is 2 pi over kx. It's the wavelength of the instability in the streamwise direction. It will be that mo um, modified by um, uh, the brunt weissler frequency and the shear in 2 pi. And when I use those dimensional units, it's nice. It tells me that if I have a perturbation in system, it can excite a critical layer at these locations, a distance basically. Well, if S is 0, as it will be, because I have a non, I'll have a steady perturbation, it'll be 1 over M away from it. So M can be 1, 2, 3. So in these dimensionless units, you don't expect a perturbation to have a finite range of excitation. So let's see how that works out. OK, so that's the point. It can only have a finite range of excitation. So here's this plane coet flow that I did. So I'm going to do rotating plane coets flow. It's stratified in the direction coming out to you. But, um, the movie actually is rotated 90 degrees. So, so the up and down direction will be the stream to ice direction. The direction out of the board is still the vertical direction towards you. And the cross stream direction is um, in that cross stream. OK. So here are some four snapshots from a, a movie which I will show you in a moment. Um, there's a perturbation of vorticity in this system. And what I'm plotting here in color is Vorticity. An unperturbed flow would all be green. If it's of one sign, it'll be blue. If it's of the other sign, it'll be red. And it's just the, got the spectrum in between. So here's four panels. And each panel, um, this is the cross stream direction, which is actually the, the numerical calculation goes much further than what I'm showing here. This is the streamwise direction, and the vertical direction's out at you. So shortly after I perturb, the perturbation vortex is at a height z that's not in this plane, so you can't see it. But this is what it's created. At one, unit 1, which corresponds to m equals 1, so there's one wavelength across here. At m equals 2, or a distance 1 half, there's one, two wavelengths in here. At a distance of 1 third, right, it'll have m equals 3, it'll have 1, 2, 3 wavelengths. So it's doing exactly as was predicted. And then what happens is that this is very similar to red spot calculations, where we start off with perturbations in a zonal flow. If the perturbation vorticity has the same sense as the shear that surrounds it, it's unstable and rolls up. So the blue is rolling up here, um, but the red isn't. 
At a later time, you know, it's becoming very big. And, but then at later times, something weird is going on, right? The perturbation is only supposed to produce um, instabilities in critical layers one unit away from it, but it's not. It's now like two or so. Well, that's okay, because what's happening here is that um, the flow is self-similar. If I produce a bunch of vortices, I can go into the frame moving with those vortices. It looks just like the original set of equations. And those new vortices perturb the flow and produce new critical layers. And they'll roll up into vortices and produce new critical layers. So let's see how that works in the movie. So can we show this movie, please? So the up and down is the streamwise direction. That's the cross stream direction. And the original 0 to 1, that's the first generation of vortices. Um, the second generation is forming from being perturbed by the first generation. And then the third generation is being perturbed. And this will go on ad nauseum. And the instability never quenches because there's an, effectively an infinite source of energy in the Keplerian shear to drive it. And it has a large amplitude. Um, one way of measuring amplitude is looking at the vorticity, that color thing here that's being produced, and dividing it by the Coriolis parameter. Right? That's a dimensionless number. It's called the Rossby number. You can show, when you go to compressible fluids, that the Rossby number and the Mach number will be pr approximately the same. The Mach number is the velocity divided by the speed of sound. This doesn't have a speed of sound because it's Boussinesque. Or in order, or, and, so anything with a Mach number of order unity or greater is considered a very big perturbation in this business. So, um, so you know, this is kind of what you end up with. And the, we, we had to come up with a name for this instability. Um, we were going to submit it. And of course, there's always polishing that has to be done. We finally ended up submitting it in the evening of October 31st. And, and it, here was an this was The astronomers don't believe that this is unstable at all. And so um, they call it the dead zone. They believe it's only unstable if you can put magnetic fields in, but magnetic fields aren't going to work in a protoplanetary disk because it's too cold to ionize the fluid. So this was known as the dead zone, and it caused a real problem for them. So we thought of, here are these vortices arising, and they're marching across the dead zone. It's October 31st. This is obviously the zombie vortex instability. Um, what else would you call it? OK, so he here's the zombie vortex. Here's the same calculation that I showed you before. And I'm just going to show you it up fairly early times. This is, again, the vertical direction. And, and this is the cross-stream direction. So you saw streamwise and cross-stream before. Here is our initial little perturbation vortex. And if we can show the movie, remember the critical layers are going to be plus and minus 1, plus and minus 2, plus and minus 3. Um, the critical layers get charged. They roll up and produce vortices. The new vortices excite new critical layers. And you produce a turbulent, vorte a, a turbulent lattice of turbulent vortices. If I let this go longer, and you'll see a longer movie in a bit, um, this would fill up the entire region with, with turbulence um, and very large amplitude turbulence. OK. So <clears throat> when we first presented this material to the astrophysical community, um, they had a lot of, 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 of uh, concerns, um, because nobody else had seen it before. Well, we know why those people haven't seen it before. Critical layers are thin. All right? If you don't have the numerical resolution to resolve the critical layer, you're not going to see a critical layer. That was one problem. The second problem is they didn't wait very long in their calculations before they turned them off. A third and the, the most um, depressing part of the calculations was in all these calculations where people were doing, looking for stability, they used ideal gases. But they said, oh, there's not, much, right, there's not much vertical component of gravity. Right? You've got a central star, and that central star is producing gravity around it. Most of it is cylindrically radial inward. Not much is vertical. And they just ignored that. And by ignoring that, they completely turned off this instability. And, and so that is, is the real problem. But they also said, well, we were using numerical methods that were not the same kind that they used, and so on and so on. We, I'll show you soon. We reproduced all of our results using the standard off-the-shelf astrophysical codes that people like. OK. But one concern, which was a concern to us also, was that um, we started with a vortex. And they say, no, no, no. We, we, now, we all know that it, you should be starting with noise, turbulence. Well, that's not clear. But since that's the accepted thing, right? you've got a, a collapsing gas cloud that's huge. And at some point, you say there's a disk there, and what's ever left is noise. Okay. So we said, we'll start with noise as an initial condition. 
So the deal was, could I reproduce this with noise? And I knew, even before starting the calculation, that it would work out, and I'll show you why. OK, so can you start with Keplerian disk plus noise? So people who study turbulence generally try and quantify the turbulence by an energy spectrum. There's a certain amount of energy per unit wave number k, so k being 2 pi over the wavelength. And generally, it's represented as a power, k to the minus a. a is called the spectral index. For the famous Kolmogorov turbulence, which we think governs many things, a is 5 thirds. OK. But this means something physically. It means if I go and integrate over a band of wave numbers and look at eddies, turbulent eddies that would be produced, I can, I can parameterize the RMS velocity of an eddy either with its wave number or with its length, which would be 2 pi over the wave number. So let's look over here. This says that the velocity of an eddy of size L, right, diameter L, is equal to the velocity of another eddy, say L is your biggest size, times little l over big L to some power. All right? So there's a power law scaling. The same thing would be true for the vorticity, that the vorticity associated with the wave number or lead also scales. So what you can show by this, then, is that for the spectral index between 1 and 3, and 5 thirds is definitely between 1 and 3, everybody's favorite index. Um, the velo right, the, see the velocity? Right, that goes as L to a negative. Right, right, for 5 thirds, the velocity goes as the length to the 1 third power. So it will, right, smaller and smaller eddies will have smaller and smaller velocities. But the vorticity will go as the length to the plus two-thirds power. So as you go to smaller eddies, the velocity is decreasing, but the vorticity will increase. And we have, we're able to show that when you, have a, when, you, when you whack something to find out, can I drive the instability, you have to know how big that whack is. Well, the whack, we found, didn't depend upon the, the velocity or the energy of the whack. It depended upon the spin or the vorticity of the whack. And since as you go to smaller and smaller lengths, right, the vorticity gets bigger and bigger, we figured we were going to be in good shape. So let me show you how that works. Right? So the vorticity is the smallest scale, as it would be in Kolmogorov. So this is to, to demonstrate that. For a k to the minus 5 thirds spectrum, right, which would be Kolmogorov, if I, on the right-hand side, I've plotted the vorticity. Right? I've just took, put up random initial conditions but with the right spectrum. All the vorticity is at the smallest scale. What you're seeing there is the resolution of the system. But all the velocity is at near the biggest scale. If I had a spectrum that fell off faster as k to the minus 5, then both the vorticity and the velocity would be at the biggest scales. But this is the case that we're really interested in. OK, so this is a hard to explain plot, so let me try to explain it to you. I did a bunch of numerical experiments starting with random turbulence. Normally, when, when um, a turbulence guy or woman plots turbulence, they plot it on a logarithmic scale as a function of wave number on this axis. And on this axis, they plot the energy that's in that scale. Well, instead of plotting the energy, I've plotted the vorticity, omega, that's in that scale, normalized by the Coriolis parameter. So it's the Rossby number. And for Kolmogorov turbulence, you'd have a spectrum like this black guy over here. It, the, the, the vorticity is going here up as the wave number, um, uh, right? It's, 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 as the wave number gets bigger and bigger, the, it, the vorticity is, is increasing appropriately. All right, and we did some experiments. We started off with an initial condition with a spectrum vorticity that looked like that. And we discovered, oh, not a big enough initial perturbation to drive the flow unstable. Um, then we just simply increased the amplitude. We kept the spectral index the same, but we increased the magnitude in front of that. And then we got this dotted line over here, and we discovered, ooh, this one, um, this one does, actually, I should show you on this one. This one does have enough energy to, to plot. And we, we did a little binary chop, and we discovered there was a critical value that if the vorticity in any location exceeded this value of Rossby number of about 0.2 or so, then you'd be unstable. This guy over here, the, the green line is, we have a finite amount of resolution in a calculation. We've got a number of grid points or a bunch of spectral coefficients or whatever, but there's a, you can't see smaller than a certain distance. That means you can't have wave numbers graded in a certain value. So that's the value. That, that's our resolution cutoff. So this guy, right, just by increasing from this black thing to that stripe line, um, would, would drive the flow unstable. Then what we said was, um, let's see. Um, we said, look, let's, let's start, instead of having 
this is our initial condition. Let's keep all the energy with the same amount of energy. Let's just ch change the spectral index and make it higher. So he went from this black line to this, this dotted line over there. And that poked above this red line too. And that was also unstable. So we could find the critical slope. But that was kind of an arbitrary ad hoc thing to determine whether the thing was unstable. The really important one is the resolution. So here we said, let's start off with a flow that did not produce zombie vortices and zombie turbulence and just increase the resolution, right? So that pushed this green line out a little bit. Well, of course, you're going to keep the same spectral index. You're going to be above that. And sure enough, this one produced turbulence. Well, if I have a protoplanetary disk with really, really big length scales, then, and if I have my Kamagorov noise initially, right, then the distance, the difference in wave number space between the largest scale, which might be, say, a pressure vertical scale height, length scale, and, and the smaller scale is many, many, many orders of magnitude. In fact, it's the square root of the Reynolds number. Um, so people think the Reynolds number of noise would be about 10 to the 12th. So the difference between this length scale or wave number and that one would be a factor of 10 to the 6th. So the, in, in a protoplanet, just the green line wouldn't be out over there. It'd be over way across the bay someplace over there. So, so all you need is a very, very small amplitude if you've got a really big scaling like that. So we were able to show that, in fact, for a protoplanetary disk, the Mach number that you would need of the instability of the, of the amplitude of the turbulence to drive the instability would be like 10 to the minus 6, right? You need a finite value, but it's really, really, really small. OK. So here's an example of, what, of that flow that became turbulent. So, um, uh, so let me say, before you do, so this is vorticity. And so it's, I'm plotting the, the, the noise here and see how the noise changes, the, the, the vorticity with respect to the Keplerian shear, if you will. And here's what happens. So up and down, this is the streamwise direction. This is the cross-stream direction. For a long time, nothing happens. Right? The flow is zipping in and out of the board. That's where the main flow is. But after a while, about 600 years, what happens is that um, you start to produce little vortices. And those vortices then start exciting critical layers. And, um, and after a certain amount of time, a thousand years or so, this is what the vorticity looks like. So blue is the one that has the same sense of sign of the local shear. Red is the opposite. The spacing here, after this mature stuff, is about one, the distance between critical layers that we showed earlier. And the velocities here, right now, this was done with a flow that has compressibility. Um, and the velocities are give you Mach numbers of about 3 to 10. So it really produces very large turbulence. It's not isotropic, like right, the, the, the initial uh, slide in this movie was isotropic and homogeneous, right? That's what Kolmogorov turbulence is. Obviously, this has a preferred direction. Um, this is up and down. And, and obviously, it's not homogeneous and it's not isotropic. OK, so um, we went through with this because people were very curious about this because no one had seen this kind of thing before. And we repeated it in basically we borrowed everybody's code we could get hold of. We did it in the Boussinesque equations for salt water, compressible flows. We did it in flows that are called anelastic, which are compressible flows where the sound waves have been suppressed. Um, we confuted it with spectral methods, finite volume and finite difference codes. Um, and, and OK, and so now I want to tell you, we went back after all of this, since we understood what we were seeing 11 years ago, and we went back and put it into what we thought would be a much more realistic model of a protoplanetary disk. And um, in that case, right, right in, for the laboratory flows, the Kuwait flow, the gravity was constant. But we want to go back to the case where the gravity is linear in Z. So everything falls into the midplane, whether it starts from the bottom or the top. And we wanted to put it in with a, a reasonable, physically um, acceptable value of the brunt Weissler frequency as a function of z, which then depends upon what the temperature is a function of z. So, um, um, OK. And, and, and the reason I was really interested in doing and wanted to show you this was because of, of one member of the audience who um, referred to a paper that was just published. One of the people, so one of the criticisms is now, oh, your instability depends upon creating very, very, very thin critical layers. 
and those will be dissipated by either viscosity or something that radiates away heat. And so they just published a paper that said, no, nope, not going to happen, Lasseur and Ladder. They claim it's not going to happen. It's not the viscosity that kills you. It's the heat transfer that kills you. Now, when you have a really, really thin layer, this layer turns out is thinner than the mean free path of a photon in the disk. So it's what's called the optically thin limit. And so they looked up, right, they went to some reference, and they looked up the optically thin limit of, of dissipation of what you might expect in a protoplanetary disk. And they put that in their calculation with constant gravity, constant bright front frequency, and constant dissipation. They said, aha, it's killed off, end of discussion. But that's not right, because that's not the way these things work. Right? We have linear gravity, not constant gravity. And the dissipation is going to be a function of distance from the midplane. The main way that heat is dissipated in the system, and normally you got photons, you got um, atoms, and they're moving around, and they might, if you heat them up, they'll have a line emission, right? They'll, they'll, they'll emit energy directly, but that's not what happens in these cases. It's so cold, the main thing that happens is that the hydrogen gas um, bumps into dust, and the dust gets collisionally excited, and then the dust radiates away energy. And so the cooling is from dust. Okay, so the amount of dust at the midplane is exponentially more than the amount of dust above and below the midplane. So it may be that the cooling time due to dust at the midplane is relatively fast, a thousandth of a year, but as you go on and off the midplane, the cooling time gets longer and longer and in a big way. So the question is, is the midplane the right place to look for damping the instability? And the answer is going to be no. So let me show you what we did in some more recent calculations. So this is the, on the, the, the red thing here is the, uh, this brunt Weishaupt frequency. So what we wanted to do was we went back through some of the papers and looked up accepted values of the brunt Weishaupt frequency. So it has to be zero at the midplane. But some of the models have it basically going up rapidly and then turning over. The horizontal axis here is actually the vertical axis, and it's units of H. H is the vertical pressure scale height. And this corresponds to some equilibrium temperature in the disk. OK, so we wanted to use something that was good. So G was going to be linear, like in a real disk, and the brunt weissler frequency is whatever we got out of the papers, basically. All right, so. Um, I'm going to show you now a movie, and I'm hope, I hope that this movie convinces you, if it plays, that um, all the action couldn't care less about what happens in the midplane of the disk. So this is, this is my flow, where we've got real linear gravity in there and real brunt Weissler frequency stabilities. This is the vertical direction. Zero is the midplane of the disk, and these are in units of pressure scale heights. In this direction, that's the streamwise direction, the direction that goes around the star, basically, or protostar. And again, it's in units of pressure scale heights. And then this is the cross-stream direction, which will be the radial direction. OK. And um, we start off with noise, right? Just noise, Keplerian noise. After 600 years, this is what happens. The zombie vortex instability has kicked in. But it kicks in somewhere between 1 and 2 pressure scale heights off the midplane of the disk, which has very, very limited amounts of dust, and therefore very long cooling times. It's not very dissipative up here at all. And you can see, oh, well, we haven't filled in the disk midplane, but we've certainly produced vorticity up here. And those Mach numbers are greater than unity. All right, another picture of this thing, of the movie I'm about to show, would be uh, after 1,300 years. And what happens here is, it's gotten more intense above and below the midplane of the disk, but it's starting to fill in the disk midplane. And what we discovered when it fills in the disk midplane, it's not filling it in with Kolmogorov turbulence, which is homogeneous and isotropic. And it's not really this zombie turbulence over there, because here we can go and detect the critical layers. Here, there's no sign of critical layers. This is simply being forced by the turbulence above it and below it into its own form of turbulence without thin critical layers, and therefore very resistant to the big dissipation times, or the big dissipation at the disk. Um, and this thing remains turbulent, but it kind of goes back and forth, like many types of turbulence and wall-bounded shear flows, between somewhat laminar state and a very turbulent state. 
Here it is just a couple hundred years later, and it's very zonal, uniform, it looks almost laminar, and then it becomes turbulent again. What reason it's becoming returbulented, if you will, is that um, the zones, right, these red bars of turbulence, can't decide how many it wants across there. Do I want five? No, no, I want six, and it'll burst into turbulence when it tries. No, no, I really wanted five, and it'll burst into turbulence, and it never settles down. So now, let's see, in the next slide, here, here's the movie. So where we're starting with um, random stuff, and boom, it's going to take a long time to start producing from that little random stuff to reverse cascade up to larger scales. And you can see, this couldn't care less what's happening at the midplane of the disk, right? That's not where the action is. But later, as it starts to fill in, right, it will care about the midplane of the disk physics, but it doesn't care that much because it's not, it's not got these thin critical layers there. And this will just go on indefinitely. Right? It just never saturates, never grows away, intermittently bursts indefinitely. So, um, and this just gives you some sort of thing. Here I've run it out to just to 2,000 years. Um, this is the local Mach number, the RMS Mach, or so the RMS Mach number of the flow. The blue is the total Mach number, and don't worry about those. Those are the streamwise and vertical components. But the, the, the Mach number, the RMS Mach number, looks like this. It's somewhere between two and three. Um, that's averaged over the entire disk, right? Just at the midplane of the disk, where people think it's very important for star formation and planet formation, um, if you go just a half a pressure scale height above and below and average it, the, right, again, this is the total Mach number. It's still greater than unity. And people believe that if you have Mach numbers greater than unity, you'll have no problem trans, um, transferring the angular momentum out of the flow to allow the protostars. Allow, now, we haven't checked. We know that for smooth laminar vortices, they tend to accumulate dust and are great places for making planetesimals. These vortices over here, right, that, that we get, that, right, they're, they're not traditional vortices. We have no idea yet whether those will accumulate dust, so we're rapidly working on that calculation now. So let me just sort of summarize. Um, to summarize, zombie turbulence, it's, it really is turbulence, and it just doesn't go away. It's not a numerical artifact. It's not an artifact of our equation of state. Um, it produces turbulence, but it's not homogeneous and isotropic. Um, the, the, the cyclonic sheets, that means that their rotation is in the same sense of the disk and opposite of the shear. That produces sheets, whereas the anticyclonic, which were blue, tend to produce more um, turbulent-looking vortices. Um, produces large Mach numbers and Reynolds numbers. And, 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 and we really think that this is applicable not only to protoplanetary disk, but we suspect it might have a role in the zonal flows that form in the giant gas planets. It might have a role in the Antarctic circumpolar current. And it certainly should be doable in the laboratory. So we know from the numerical simulations that we can create this in a laboratory. And, and having it done in the laboratory, I think, would go a long way to convincing people that it's a real phenomenon. So right now, I've got a couple of students whose PhD thesis are to work out in as much detail to search from parameter space the place that would be the most inexpensive for our laboratory experimentalists to find it. And we'll hope we'll have that in a couple of years. And a couple of groups have said that they'd be very interested in doing it. So I thank you for your attention. I'll take any questions you might have. All right, thank you, Phil. Uh, we do have time for questions. That's a very interesting talk. Uh, people for a long time have wondered about turbulence and how turbulence arises in a disk so that you can build planets and transfer the mass from the edge to the center. But they found the conditions are really quite different from near the star to very far out. Mm -hmm. That certain kinds of stability would appear, or instability would appear further out versus further in. How is what you talk about dependent on the distance okay, from the star? Question. Very good question. So, so we have people in this very audience, like uh, like Orkin Umerhan, who's somewhere here, who has its own variations of instability. So, so okay. So the people, right? So if you look historically, people were very upset because they said, "Oh, it's going to be stable. We can't produce stars. We can't produce planets. We can't produce chondrules that look sensible." All right. Then there was this magnetic, this hydromagnetic instability 
that everybody loved, MRI. And it's great for high energy objects like black holes and neutron stars, but these disks have cold gas, maybe 50 degrees absolute. And so you can have all the magnetic fields you want. There's, nothing, there's no ionization going on, so there's nothing to couple to. Now people first said, well, maybe very high above the midplane or very far below the midplane of the disk, where you've got heating due to cosmic rays or from the star itself, maybe you could get enough ionization there that, that things might couple into the disk and go downward. But I think people have pretty much given up on that idea. A similar thing is that if you go far enough out in the disk, right, then you also might have MR instabilities would, would, would be possible. And people want to know, can you bring that turbulence all the way in to say 1 to, 100, to say 50 AU to get that region to be turbulent so that you could transfer the angular momentum amount of that? And the answer is looking more and more like no, that you can't do that. Then there are purely hydrodynamic instabilities that people have looked at. And they have their own special requirements of, for example, one of them might require that there, in these disks, there's no vertical shear, that the Keplerian velocity is independent of height off the disk. Right? If you relax that condition, there's a whole set of instabilities that you can get to. In addition, if you assume that the disk on the, in, in the radial direction has um, um, variations in its uh, runt weissler frequency, um, you can also get instability. So, so I would say right now, there are a number of groups looking at a number of different instabilities, and it'll be important to see um, which ones are robust, which ones where the instability might start but then fade away. There are plenty of instabilities that do that. Um, so it's got to be a self-sustaining one. And, you know, in, in these calculations, like we've integrated for three or four thousand years, right? The, the slide that I showed you earlier of Balbus's calculation is very typical of what people do in these studies. They integrated for six years. Six is a lot smaller than four thousand. And I've seen many, many instabilities. Normally, I'm, I'm a computational fluid dynamist working in fluid dynamics, and I've seen many, many instabilities in fluids that look really promising for all sorts of things. That they have really fast growth rates. And then very, very quickly, they poop out with almost nothing. It grows, but the amplitude it grows to is negligible. I mean, you can barely tell it from the original thing. So it's got to be robust, which this is. It's got to have, um, right, it, it's got to lead to very large Mach numbers, which this does. Um, and, and so um, I would say this, based on what I know about the, or what I suspect is true about the, the, the dissipation times, I would say this instability would, would work between about 1 and 100 AU, okay, just based on, on, on those things. Um, other ones, I, I, I can't, I, I don't want to try and vouch for other instabilities. Other instabilities, the, the, the MRI is the most published one where they would not claim typically to get an instability within 100 AU of the central protostar. Orkin, where, where does your instability come in? Right. That's exclusive to where your, uh, yeah. where the where, zombies where exist. Where it opposite where yours works, mine yeah. doesn't, and vice versa. Uh, and ours, sit, or ours, you know, this right. process that right. we seem to have uncovered seems to operate, again, between 1 and, and about 50 AU near the disk midplane, where it's very optically thick. Yeah. So it's completely exclusive to uh, where yours... Uh, and, and, your dissipation. And, and, and these things could be coexisting, by the way, in yeah. different parts of the disk right. that are. Right. So, yeah. and, and, and yours one would pr pr presumably be damp in the optic. Is, the optically thick regime is important for your. That's right, because when you go optically thin, thin us, the, 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 the when it happens when you're in a system where it's thermally driven, the shear that you get, which is vertically varying, is thermally in place. The, uh, it, it, that is the source of the energy that drives the turbulence. When you go optically thin, the system reacts and, and, and um, adjusts to mask the instability and it shuts off on its own. So that's, but that's where something like where your mechanism yeah. um, um, would come in and save the day if we are keen to enliven dead zones. That's the idea, of course. Um, 
Uh, actually, I did have a question. So what, what is your opinion about the possibility that the strato-rotational instability might be a good laboratory analog of uh, the zombies? Right, well, the strato-rotational instability um, is, um, the problem with that is that you need one or two boundaries, right, to, to, to drive it. So it, it, it's been seen in laboratory coet, circular coet flow where you've got two boundaries. But in, in, a, in a Keplerian disk, the, there, there's nothing quite analogous to a real solid boundary. And so it's not at all obvious that SRI w would work in that limit. That's the problem. And so when we do this, by the way, in the laboratory, we have to be in the regime where SRI does not operate because we don't want to be confused with that instability. Uh, Phil, I, I was a little confused about this opacity regime. The, the regime where the cooling time is inversely proportional to the density, that's the op that is the optically thin regime. Okay. But in the optically thick regime, it goes the other way. So, so, um, so it, when we're, we are optically thin when we're away from the mid-plane of the disk. No, that, that's always true. Is. That's always and true. And we're optically thick at the midplane of the disk. So, That's always true. Right, okay, so, so what, I mean, and, and the reason I say that is not, not because of anything having to do with dust and this and that, it's you can have a region that is, for some things, is optically thin, and for other regions, for other processes, optically thick. So for example, if I have a critical layer and its thickness is um, 10 to the minus four to 10 to the minus five, a pressure scale height, then in most regions of a disk of interest, that critical layer it's, going, its thickness is going to be less than a photon mean-free path, right? Which is about probably about ten to the minus three in many circumstances. Well, so that depends. Well, that just depends on on what the optical depth is. So that's what well, I'm saying. Is well, no, well, if you're in the optically thick right, regime, right? Right. So, so or, okay. You know. So, so what, what I'm saying is that okay. So, so what I'm saying is that okay. So numerically, um, okay. Let, or let me say it this way: we we've put in dissipation that would be. Um, and you can do this as a function of wave number, that for wave numbers that, or wavelengths that are large, right, larger than what you expect of a photon mean free path, you want to, you're, you put in the optical thick, uh, optically thick cooling time. And for wavelengths that are smaller than a mean free path, which would be the critical layer and above, we put in that appropriate for optically thin. So in the same region, yeah, okay. what I'm trying to say is in the same region, we have both optically thick dissipation and optically thin dissipation. And because it's a spectral code, it's easy to do, we, we go from one to the other as a function of what the wavelength is of the mode that we're looking at. So you have a real opacity, not just a cooling time. Yes, parameter. right. So we have something, we have, we have terms, yes. Exactly. So, so, so we put in both types of cooling. We said, right, depending upon um, what the wavelength is. Okay. Hi. Uh, unlike Orkan, I'm not an expert in this field. So I have some, a basic question about future research in your yeah. modeling, which is I'm assuming that you're, you're, you're believing that planets form in the center of these vortices, or some of these vortices. Well, planet okay, so, so, all right, so, so let me say, it's a long way from planetesimals, which are yes. just objects that can start self-gravitating, to planets. And it's a long way from 100 micron size dust to, to planetesimals, which are like, you know, think of a kilometer or something like that. So the point is that, um, um, what we can do in the calculations um, is to see how well vortices accumulate dust. Okay, so so nor normal vortices, um, n normal vortices like 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 um, uh, li like those you know in your bathtub, which have low pressure centers, they'll centrifuge stuff out. But vortices in a, in a disk like this, because the Coriolis force is important, have high pressure centers. And like they the, suck red, stuff the red in. spot, they're out there high pressure Like zones. a red spot, right, we'll, we'll suck stuff in. Okay, so what we have done in the past is for <laughs> laminar vortices, we've calculated, and other people too, for us, calculated how much dust comes in. You know, and, and then there's a point where you have to 
turn off the calculation and cross your fingers and say, oh, the accumulated dust agglomerates together somehow. Maybe it's, you know, maybe, um, you know, it's got an ice coating on it or something that melts. Okay, we haven't done any of calculations of how dust does. And these very, very, these are, these are really turbulent vortices. Um, I have no idea how they're going to do on dust. So are you going to extend past 1,000, 4,000 years to 10,000, 100,000 Well, we'll put in dust originally for the first 4,000 years and see how it goes. Where does, yeah. I mean, we have no idea whether it's going to be any accumulation whatsoever. So we'll, we'll, we'll let it integrate depending upon what we find. And things so like so you'd have I mean, to allow for gravity too, right, once you start yeah, creating Yeah, you, I mean, it's just adding it to the calculation here. Um, I'm not interested. So, just a quick question: How can you observe doing observation to confirm for the um, this way? So, oh, okay, so observables. Well, okay. So, when when the James Webb Telescope comes on, what are we going to see? Um, not clear. It's it's not at all obvious if there's going to be some sort of signatures of this that we can identify. For example, you never know. I mean, one signature might be if it turns out that our calculations. You know, for a wide variety of Weissler frequency distributions and other things, shows that you get this bursting time, kind of time scale. Um, we're, we're not going to live, I'm not going to live enough to see bursting cycles, but it may mean that if you did, you've had an ensemble of, of protoplanetary disks, you know, you'd find that some fraction of them are in the turbulent state and some fraction of them would be in the laminar state. And if those have different signatures, it may be that when people start classifying protoplanetary disks, they get more and more, they find they, they divide into, empirically into two clusters of, of, of data points and how to explain them. Th this may be the answer. So the, the answer is, you know, um, we're going to need a lot of serendipitous, fortunate circumstances to see any signature directly at, at this point, yeah. No, no, please don't, because it's being recorded. Uh, <clears throat> you showed that you need a Kolmogorov spectrum, or you were demonstrating this with a Kolmogorov okay. spectrum. Now, when we think about uh, a real planet, protoplanetary disk, uh, what's the source of that initial okay. spectrum so, so, in your right, idea? So we're and not that restricted. Anyway, it, it's a spectral index between one and whatever it was, three or yeah. And, and so that's a pretty broad range. Okay. The answer to that question is, is a project that was uh, sort of started and stopped and started and stopped. Um, so people like Chris McKee and, and Richard Klein, right, they, they for the last 15 years have done calculations that begin much earlier than mine. They, they start off with when you've got cores collapsing and the cores are collapsing and, you know, and, and it's, it's very turbulent and, and they can take it as far as something that with some imagination looks like a disk. It's certainly, when you look at the density profiles, they don't look axisymmetric. Um, it, it's, you know, big perturbation. So some, there's this missing link, right, between what the calculations that people do of core collapses, which are highly turbulent, highly inhomogeneous things, and where people um, who, who, like Balbus and, and, and those guys do, and me, that, that say, okay, I'm gonna start with a Keplerian disk with noise on it, right? Somewhere there's something in between. And it may well be that there's an instability that never lets you down, down to this. It may take off before you relax to such a laminar looking situation. So, you're so suggesting so, that. So yeah, there's a whole series of calculations that need to be done, mm -hmm. the missing link calculations. I think that's totally fair. So you're suggesting that, that this is maybe active in the earliest stages of the protoplanetary disk after well, it pops out. Right, well, you know, I've never cloud. seen a core collapse go to something that you would you know, if you just, how, does this look like a disk? Well, not really. I mean, you know, if, if you plot the average as muthal velocities as a function of radius, you know, the, 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 the RMS error on that is greater than the signal. I mean, they have not been able to calculate from a core collapse down to something that looks like a Keplerian disk. But you can bet, you know, that, that, that it's not going to go directly suddenly, boom, oh, I've just going to be a laminar disk now. There's going to be all these stages and maybe one of them will be a stage that corresponds to a laminar disk with noise on it, which was what everybody basically in the community does for late stage. But we don't know. <laughs>
Um, I'm not too familiar with these core collapse uh, calculations that have high turbulence, but you'd think that um, uh, a rotating star would by itself produce some kind of uh, um, uh, flattening and a disk. Uh, um, okay, well, okay, so, so the idea behind the core collapse is that, right, you've got this vast thing out there, and, and it's going to have some angular momentum associated with it. So it's going to have an angular momentum axis. And, and basically, along the angular momentum axis, nothing um, inhibits collapse. But eventually, along the angular, in a perpendicular angular momentum axis, the, 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 the angular momentum, the centrifugal forces will say, OK, I'm going, to, I'm going to hold back the collapse. And that's why you end up with disk-shaped objects. And, and we see, you, you can certainly see in the core collapse calculations that you, you get away from the nearly spherical initial conditions, for sure. I mean, at the, at the end of these things, there's something that is definitely um, compressed along the rotation axis. But to call it a Keplerian disk, right, the, the angular velocity does not go as the ra cylindrical radius to, to the minus 3 halves power in any smooth way. It's very noisy. And it's very non-axisymmetric. Right. I, I think we'd better leave uh, further questions for uh, uh, individual. People can come up and continue to talk to Phil. Uh, we have our traditional SETI talk mug as a token mm. of our thanks uh, for talking to us about this uh, topic. So let's thank Phil Marcus one more time. Thank, thank you. you.